welcome to episode 295 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Nathan Smith. Ash Baker. And Dylan Moore. And in today's episode, we will be talking about movies that we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we will be concluding our Patreon pick series with 2007's No Country for Old Men. Which, as I'm saying, I forgot who this is for pick for. And I will I will rectify that in the beginning of part two. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go look it up. We have it somewhere on the books. Um, Apologies, Patreons. Zach is canceled. I thought you were going to do it like a robocall, like just somewhere in the middle of this. You just insert their voice here. I mean, I can, I can, I can, yeah. you know, kill some time and, and pull it up if we need, wanted to. I just don't feel like doing that, you know. Okay. I did. I already got canceled by one of An- Andrew's students who wants to debate me about nostalgia. So you've been canceled so many times, Zach. You know your your mispronunciation. That's true. Um, some guests we've been canceled over. We did. I the I think the most awkward guest. I'm just we're, we're gonna just you know go inside or you know inside baseball in this at the beginning <laughs> of the podcast. We had the one guest who had the loud cat, and then we didn't really hang up with him at before, and so then we started just like making fun of his cat, and he was still on the call, and it was awkward. Oh, yeah. So maybe what? maybe I, I wasn't nice. the only one making fun of the cat, but maybe. <laughs> Maybe I got canceled for that as well. Yeah, I know. Let's go ahead and jump in the movie. That's why they call it Cinematary, because we're dead. Uh That's There it is. (laughs) There it is. (laughs) Ash, will you please uh, kill this monotonous streak with with the X-Files? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Um, Anytime. I just want to preface this by saying I am a huge X-Files fan. I love the X-Files. This week I watched um, the Wait, second. Wait, did you say I am? Did you say I am huge X Files fan? Into the, <laughs> yes, like, I am like huge X Files fan. <laughs> <laughs> I am huge X Files fan. Um, uh, this week I watched the second X Files movie, uh, which is X Files. I want to believe it comes after season nine, which is terrible. Because um, David Duchovny leaves after, like, one episode. And, you know, we love Julian Anderson, but, like, we can, we just can't handle it, you know, with, like, you know, just Julian Anderson. We need the, the dynamic duo. Um, but anyway, so it comes after season nine and before the reboot slash miniseries season ten. And it's it's really bad. Um, I said in my letter box review, it sucks alien balls. Um, it, the first X-Files movie people said sucked, but I disagree really hard on the first one. Um, the first one is like, it comes, you know, just before, uh, season eight, I think, or maybe, yeah, it comes before season eight and it's like, Oh, aliens, sexual tension between Mulder and Scully, UFOs, alien blood. It's like everything you want out of the X-Files. And then this X-Files movie is like um, Mulder and Scully uh, following around a um, fake, uh, what do you call it? Somebody who can see the future. Uh, psychic. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, that's the go. word. <laughs> I was getting there. <laughs> Who's also like a Catholic pedophile um, for no reason. Wow. <laughs> um, it, it's just like nonsensical. But it's like after season nine, like Mulder's wanted by the FBI. And for no reason, Scully's like, listen, Mulder, you have to go help the FBI do this thing and they'll forgive you. And Mulder's like, why would I do that? Like, they tried to kill me. And Scully's like, just do it because the greater good, Mulder. And he's like, okay, because I love you. And so, and he's like, I'll do it if you help me. And then they start doing, like, going on the mission or whatever. And Scully's like, actually, I don't want to do this. And Mulder's like, 
no, Scully, you have to do this because I'm doing this. The greater good, Scully. And it's like, there's zero motivation for anything. Are they in hot fuzz? (laughs) Yeah, there's like no motivation for literally them doing any of the things that they're doing. They're just there walking around, following around this Catholic pedophile psychic guy to find someone. It's, It's very terrible. And I really hated watching it. In season 10, the reboot when they're old is like, you know, a lot of people think that's bad too. But it's really, um, at least it's like nostalgic, you know, your characters, your faves come on the screen and you're like, hey, you know, there they are. It's Mulder and Scully. We missed them. But in this movie, it's like, no, I don't want to see you like you're, you're not doing the thing well. It, it's just very poorly written and Mulder has a beard and it's supposed to be like a big reveal when he shaves, but he's like old and not looking so hot. So when he shaves, it's like not really climactic at all. Sad movie. Just watch the just watch like season like two and three over again if you like want your X Files vibes. That's my take. All right. Um. For, for X-Files fans who are interested, is it streaming anywhere or just catch it somewhere that you can... It is on Hulu, oh, where the entire X-Files series is also streaming. So skip it and just rewatch the good old series. I love you, Jillian Anderson and David Duchovny. If you ever hear this, please... <laughs> don't be offended i love you oh my god i just realized the end of that movie okay all right <laughs> i remembered uh nathan uh, nathan i'm gonna toss it over to you you had a couple movies you wanted to talk about yeah, yeah, yeah. so um i want to talk first about a movie that you can catch on hbo go or hbo now until the end of this month and that is clint eastwood's classic romance The Bridges of Madison County, um, which is a movie, you know, I remember growing up, my parents having the novel by Robert James Waller that the movie tie in copy of the novel. And so I was always kind of like, oh, this is the kind of movie that like my parents watch, you know, or that like grown ups watch. Um, And over the past couple of years, I feel like I've been seeing a lot of people on Twitter and Letterboxd saying like, oh, this is like one of the best movies of the 90s, one of Clint Eastwood's best movies. And so I've been meaning to watch it for a a minute. Um, And uh, I had high expectations and it really met those expectations. Um, I feel like I have not seen a movie this good in a minute. Um... If you don't know the plot, um, it stars, of course, Clint Eastwood and Meryl Streep. Um, It is about um, Meryl Streep, her children. When Meryl Streep dies, they find in her house all of these love letters to this guy who is not their father. And they're like freaking out. They're like, whoa, what is, you know, our mom's secret life, you know? Uh, like what's going on here. Um, and you know, they always thought that that their mother was kind of a very meek, quiet, uh, tasteful woman. And they found out that she had this lurid, passionate affair when they were teenagers. Um, and so they dig into these journals that the, that their mother left. And then we see kind of what happened. And basically one weekend, um, Meryl Streep's husband, and the teens went out uh, for some kind of like, um, not like, they don't say that it's like FFA or 4-H, but it's that kind of like animal breeding competition, you know, like farm competition stuff that, that kids in the country do sometimes. So she's, uh, Meryl Streep is, uh, has the house to herself and... She is standing on the front porch one day and up comes um, Clint Eastwood, who is this worldly, well-traveled, well-educated 
um, photojournalist for National Geographic, and um, it takes place in Iowa around where there are these like covered bridges and he's trying to take pictures of the covered bridges for an article, but he can't find them. So he asks for directions. So she goes with him to one of the covered bridges. They strike up a conversation. They're kind of getting along, starting to flirt a little bit. They go back to her house, you know, they have a lemonade, they have a coffee, they have a glass of whiskey. Things start getting a little heated, you know, it's, it's the sweltering summer. They're both sweating a lot, trying to get cool, trying to get some relief. And they have these passionate four days together that change each other's lives. And, you know, Meryl Streep, I didn't know going into this movie that Meryl Streep in this movie is Italian. She's like, it takes place in the 60s, and she's like an Italian war bride who met her husband, who was an American GI in Italy, and she came over to iowa with him and she had no idea where she was going she just thought it was oh this is america like i want to go there so she had no idea she was going to you know like just this flat rural farmland that's not very exciting you know she thought she was going to like the big city or something um and at first I was like, oh, whoa, Meryl Streep doing this like Italian accent. I don't know if I'm going to buy this. But very quickly, just like you immediately buy her as this woman who is like very quiet in her manner, but has this whole kind of like world that she's kept to herself, you know, as she's had kids and raised them. And Clint Eastwood just like activates all of these kind of feelings and desires and dreams in her that she thought that she had forgotten. Um, and it's just like. You know, I don't know. Uh, Some people are not fans of Clint Eastwood at all, actor or director. Some people like him as an actor, but they don't like him as a director. I think he's great on both counts, and I'm kind of a defender of some of his movies. Um, But I just think that this is just, like, such a fucking classic, like, Hollywood melodrama, you know? It's just, like, total Douglas Sirk movie, like, All That Heaven Allows, which we've done an episode about before, which is about a similarly kind of middle-aged woman who has this very passionate romance um, and is very concerned about, you know, how the community around her is going to perceive this love affair if they're going to find out about it. You know, she's concerned about, like, if she should run away with Clint Eastwood or if she should stay and wait for her kids to come back and stay with them and just stay devoted to them. And it has all of these kind of, like, moral existential questions, and it's just, like, very sexy and sumptuous and passionate. Um, It's just, like, a gorgeous-looking movie, Um, very sweaty, very hot, Um, and it just had me all kinds of messy crying. You know, it's just like a very passionate movie. Um, Also, it bears mentioning it's produced in addition to Mal Paso Production, which which is Clint Eastwood's production company. It's also produced by Amblin Entertainment, you know, the uh, production company of Steven Spielberg. So you've got like shaking hands, like some of the best in the business, the best in like Hollywood of this era working together here. So it's just a total five star movie for me on all counts. I love this movie. Um, I'm currently imagining the meme of two muscle bound arms clasping hands. And it's oh, wait, that's Wood exactly what Steven I was Spoon. wanting you to okay. imagine. Right. I literally, I think when I saw this, I you tweeted this out like Amblin, Mel Paso, <laughs> Bridges of Madison County in the oh, middle coming goodness. together. So watch this before it expires on HBO before the end of the month. Highly recommend. Yeah, I think I'm going to because I, 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 I'm like you. I've seen people talking about it a bunch and comparing it to Douglas Sirk. And so I'm not a giant Clint yeah, Eastwood yeah, yeah. person, but it seems like one I would get into. Yeah, I think so. It seems like a, the, the dynamic is kind of different because it's like a, a from kids point of view, looking back as opposed to in the moment, because like a lot of Douglas Sirk is yeah. in that way. And well, you know, yeah, I didn't really mention it, but you do kind of a very strong subplot in the movie is, you know, the kids having not, <laughs> of course, a romance, but having over a couple of days of like very emotional experience or like they're now both the age that their mom was when she had this romance. And they're both kind of in marriages that they're not really sure about anymore, you know, where the 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 
loved, you know, and the passion has maybe stalled out a little bit. So as they find out about their mom's secret life, they're like, whoa, you know, she was reevaluating everything around this time. Maybe we should reevaluate everything, too. So that's a very strong kind of point in the movie, too. And so I think it gives it a lot of really reflective perspective. Um yeah, it's it's so it's not just the first person kind of like passionate romance. It's got this critical distance to it, I think, too. Nice. Uh, you had a double feature, though, you wanted to hit on next. Yeah, real quickly, uh, I'll try to kind of combine these movies. I want to do another uh, little little Nathan's defense corner. You know, sometimes I've gotten in hot water with our listeners with defending um, widely derided movies um, but I want to put a word in for my boy, Cameron Crow. Um, I've been watching a couple of his movies recently. I rewatched Aloha, which is, I think, one of the best American movies of this century. And I know that a lot of people don't like this movie. Um, it was a little bit controversial when it came out in 2015, because basically it's about a military base in Hawaii and it stars Emma Stone, who is just a completely white person um, as someone who is like mixed race, um, part native Hawaiian, um, part like Scandinavian, I think, or something like that. Um, and so it was kind of controversial for that cat for that casting. And a lot of people just kind of canceled it for that reason, which is, uh, I will just say up front, you know, it's very unfortunate casting. I wish that they had picked somebody else different or just written that role different, you know, uh, or whatever, because I don't think, you know, that, <laughs> Uh, uh, Emma Stone should be in that role, of course. But I think beyond that, it's actually like one of the most intelligent Hollywood movies that I've seen, you know, of the 2010s of the 21st century. Basically, it has Bradley Cooper as this like former um, American soldier who's now sort of a private military contractor, but he works for this kind of like almost Tesla, SpaceX like tech startup company that's run by Bill Murray, who plays this like startup guru guy. And so Bradley Cooper comes to this military base in Hawaii where he was previously stationed and where he previously had a romance with Rachel McAdams, who is now married to John Krasinski and they have some kids together. So he's coming back and some tensions are flaring up again. And the reason why he's coming to this base in Hawaii is because they're trying to launch a new satellite out of the space. And of course, the United States government doesn't have the resources to actually build or launch the satellite anymore. So they outsource it to this uh, private contractor, Bill Murray, and he is trying to sneak nuclear weapons onto the satellite because he wants to have his own private personal like nuclear arsenal he's trying to use the united states satellite to basically start his own private military as a billionaire and bradley cooper goes into it knowing this nobody else knows this eventually emma stone who plays the sort of like military assistant liaison who's assigned to bradley cooper you know they're working together sparks fly they fall in love they have similar interests they're both really obsessed with astronomy they get together and she finds out about this private nuclear arsenal and she's really upset. She's like, Bradley Cooper, how could you do this? Like, you know, she's like, I'm part Hawaiian. Like, how could you disrespect Hawaii and the native people of Hawaii <laughs> like this? You know, because they got permission from like the native leader of the nation of Hawaii to launch the satellite, you know, to say that it's OK to launch this over native grounds. And he specifically swore that there were not weapons on it, which there are. And so to spoil it, I'm really sorry to spoil it, but I feel like this is one of those movies you have to spoil to sell people on a little bit because it's so crazy. But basically they launched the satellite. Bill Murray has his billionaire weapons in the sky now. And Emma Stone is like devastated. And then Bradley Cooper takes the entire history of recorded audio and video 
uh, like a so- sound and video waves and shoots it at the satellite so it like overwhelms it and overloads it and ex- and it explodes and then the satellite like blows up and comes crashing down and it diffuses the weapons and then he exposes Bill Murray and becomes a hero and he gets the girl by disabling the satellite with the entire history of recorded sound and video um and it also it's just like kind of anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist a little bit. Like it feels a little bit like a Thomas Pynchon rom com. Um, like it has yeah. this, it has this <laughs> Hawaiian nationalist leader playing himself as a main character in the movie, and the whole time he's walking around wearing a shirt that says "Hawaiian by birth, American by force." And I just have a hard time imagining many other people in Hollywood like having a character like that in and a real life person like that in a, in, in a Hollywood movie. Um, it's kind of astonishing. Um, and I don't know, it's just got like a great soundtrack too. Like it's got a great party dance scene with Danny McBride as a DJ. Um, some great needle drops. I really like Bradley Cooper. I think he's like a great actor and has great screwball energy. Um, I normally don't even like John Krasinski that much, but I think he's fantastic in this movie. I love Rachel McAdams in it. Emma Stone, I'm not often crazy about, but she's, you know, I think good in this movie too, despite the unfortunate casting. So I don't know. I really recommend that people give this movie a chance. I think it's like another movie that Zach and I have talked about a little bit previously downsizing, which was another kind of problematic canceled movie that's actually far more intelligent than I think people gave it credit for. I think this is another case like that where it's a little bit different movie than people uh, were expecting. Yeah. Oh damn. My, I'm going to have to go watch Aloha <laughs> so, now because I'm <laughs> super team downsizing uh, yeah. over I'm here. I'm going to have to um, yeah, agree to the point of having no idea what Aloha was actually about because I just assumed it was uh, a, a, pat, a pat enough rom-com towards it's like, okay, and the title has nowhere near the notion of the rest of no. the ridiculous machinations that uh, you just described. Okay. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. I mean, I knew people like on Letterboxd and stuff love this movie and have uh-huh. reclaimed, tried to reclaim it. So I went in knowing that, but I had no idea about this whole political Go. plot. And it just Go kind figure. of blew me away. Um, I also just like I'm not going to go I'm not going to say very much about it, but I also just want to say Cameron Crowe's movie Vanilla Sky. Uh Also amazing. Super crazy movie. Trippy movie. Basically like AI for adults, (laughs) I think. Um, One of the strangest movies I've ever seen, but made me feel some things, I will say. So go give that one a chance too. I think Cameron Crowe. Better. Then he gets credit for, and also Jerry Maguire and Almost Famous, not the only good ones. Not even the best ones, I think. I think these Aloha Vanilla Sky, his best movies. Was there something, like, strange uh, about uh, Eyes Wide Shut and Vanilla Sky coming out in, like, a two-year period difference? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, Eyes Wide Shut, like, was in production forever, so, I mean, that's a little different. But, like, after that, Vanilla Sky was no. damn near his next movie or something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's also crazy it came out similarly time to Minority Report because all of these movies are kind of about, like, Tom Cruise being a guy where, like, the world is, like, totally inside his head, um, which I think kind of is, like, a problem that Tom Cruise has in real life that he's trying to sort out. He's convinced himself of uh, that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I think all of those movies are really interesting thinking about them in relation to one another. It's also very interesting thinking about it as a sequel to Jerry Maguire because Jerry Maguire is kind of the same thing, you know, about this dude who's like, the movie is just like his mind, like his whole world that's just like wealthy white sports agent who makes money off of the bodies of black athletes. Like, this is just like that movie, but more deranged with more drug addiction, more like overtly like psychotic and and uh, more overtly like just I don't know, dissociative, like just kind of disconnected from reality and just like in a totally the oh, totally huh. uh, solipsistic world of the protagonist's like own that. creation. I don't know. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> cool stuff. Cameron Crow, love him. Uh, I'm gonna have to watch a, my oh, boy. I'm gonna have to watch Aloha now, I guess. <laughs> Give him another movie. Yeah, you know, we'll see how it goes. Uh, Dylan, you had a movie. Uh, yeah. So, uh, recently I uh, finally got around to watching uh this Chewy Hark movie, 
Shanghai Blues. Um, uh, yeah, that's great. I don't know um, what drew me to this one, other than I think Nathan watched it and liked it quite a bit, and uh, I've been going kind of chronologically as best as I can through uh, some of uh, uh, the director's highlights, you know, because uh, I haven't, you know, watched any of his more contemporary Detective D, you know, uh, CG shenanigans <laughs> yet. But uh, this one's still earlier on in like 1984, and it's set right before the uh, start of the S- Second Sino-Japanese War, and then immediately after it finishes, and it <laughs> it more or less follows uh, a district of Shanghai that I think at the time was a, a French kind of you know outpost to just hang out and get sloppy and make deals or whatever and uh in this nightclub um mainly and uh the one of the main characters that we follow is is a clown (laughs) between him and his dad have like a clown troop that go out but because he hears about the oncoming war uh he decides to become a soldier and somewhere in between him quitting his dad his dad proud of him surprised and proud of him uh, and trying to clean him up for him to, you know, go enlist or whatever. Uh, the firebombing of Shanghai ends up occurring, and he gets trapped underneath this bridge and is trying to figure out what to do. And then another, uh, another person, a woman, it's comes down Madison there. Not Madison County, though, right? It's not <laughs> Madison <laughs> County. Uh, yeah, there's a Madison County Just Shanghai. Checking. Who, who, who knew? Clint Eastwood had a hand in it, also. Um, but uh, but uh, another person, a woman, comes um, to seek shelter in, underneath this bridge, and they and they both kind of like make a promise to each other. Like she hears about what him about to go off to war, and her trying to figure out what to do uh, during all this, um, and how to salvage a life. And they kind of make a promise to meet up after the war is over, and so that kind of set out the premise to where jump to like eight years into the future in the mid forties. Um, of course, you know, he gets back from war, he, that, like, they don't know each other, how can you find somebody after that? Um, and if I remember correctly, he's a part of, uh, a, a military marching band? Uh, like, he's, like, welcoming a train in, and he's playing the yeah, tuba, and there's, like, a lot of slapstick with him and a tuba? Uh, if I had to like pull a, a total thread so. of what's going on in this movie, it is su- and a surprising amount of slapstick considering the setting, which um, I don't know, like out of the Troy Hark movies I've seen of like uh, uh, Green Snake and Once Upon a Time in China and Blade. And uh, I think the main one before this is like Dangerous Encounters of the first kind. And I, I mean, I know that <laughs> movie has like this oh, yeah, you know yeah, dark yeah. comedy slapstick, but yet somehow I just didn't believe that that was going to be the tone that was going to go on in this movie <laughs> um, yeah he is really the master of like yeah tonal shifts between movies and also within um, individual movies so I, and genre I shifts too i absolutely believe that um and i don't know like it, it it does more or less play as a comedy but what eventually happens is like a love triangle forms um more or less between uh, a, a, a woman who's also trying to get by who runs into the woman we find out was underneath the bridge. They become roommates. She's still working as a nightclub singer. Um, and then they find out that uh, the, the guy in question is actually lives upstairs, but they have no idea who each other are yet. You know, they haven't made that kind of like connection or, or like remembrance yet, uh, but they at least the both the people underneath the bridge are still like aspiring to go go back under the bridge and find that person there and the next time the guy goes down there there's a whole bunch of uh homeless and uh uh disabled bodied people uh just you know post war shit's fucked up and they just don't have a place to live anymore and that and they're just kind of like stayed together underneath there and like try to scrape by uh, and I, I don't know, like, uh, to to the point of being surprised about the tone is just how much Hark actually just gets those kind of, like, post-war uh, bits in there of, like, what would actually, what the scenario is actually like, but but able to play it for last without it being too, like, stupid or kind of, like, 
too too much because it's like you know the severity of life's in poverty after the war is serious i mean uh even much so that like the black market that is like the through line of this movie too of people trying to like really wring american dollars out for as much as they're worth and like absorbent amount of price for like rice and food and just uh things like that to where like somehow in the midst of all that is what is tantamount to a farce ends up occurring and i don't know if i want to spoil the back half of this movie um but the the one woman who is the other roommate that has uh, now become like an unrequited love interest to uh the main guy um ends up as a calendar girl on accident because she was trying to go down and uh oh god what was the deal she, she was trying to i think get food from the black market but she gets pushed into this line thinking it was for food and it was actually for a calendar girl competition to where you know these uh, greasy dudes uh business owners uh, like all brought a pool of money together to like have uh yeah <laughs> have uh have a beauty contest more or less and to decide who's the calendar girl uh or sorry calendar queen and um yeah um and there there is some questionable like uh uh like um an assault joke towards the back end of this movie that it's just like yeah you know it f- functions probably for when it was but um it's still just like oh there's uh <laughs> date rape in here great thanks <laughs> Um, yeah that's the problem with so many hong kong movies is there's just like especially of this era it's just like bad casual jokes or gags or not even gags but like a serious but like really uncomfortable melodramatic like employments of rape and assault and other things um but so one of the main actresses that i um uh, actually did recognize uh was sylvia chang she played uh, oh, yeah, the yeah, love yeah. interest underneath the bridge, uh, making that promise, and she's great. Like she, like she, both her and Absolutely. Sally Sallier, who plays the uh, other roommate, their their comedic performances are ridiculous. I mean, it's like uh, almost um, that kind of broad kind of comedy and slapstick that was in um, uh, uh, Legend of the Drunken Master with the aunt. It's just yeah, like yeah, the same yeah. level of just like physical comedy that's just ridiculous and act, like you know. But besides the the questionable jokes, it's just uh, those them as actors and uh, comedians uh, kept me in that movie for a good deal. Uh, so uh, I don't know. For I sure. would, I would, it's funny. Yeah, I'd still recommend it. It's um, it's ridiculous. I don't know where it's streaming. I had to find a website that it was streaming, but I don't know how you know reputable it is. It could be on so, like Daily Motion or yeah, one of those things. Yeah, that's very likely so or youtube or yeah um you know if you know where if you're listening and you know where to find things you you can probably find it somewhere (laughs) there you go Uh, just just dig around a little bit yeah come on use your (laughs) noggin it's 2020 come on we're quarantined you can't go to blockbuster no more (laughs) you can't even go to Redbox. (laughs) you know can't trust um, it. We'll take a quick break and then we will be back and we're going to talk about the Coen brothers and No Country for Old Men after this. Hey, Century listeners, Andrew here. At the midpoint of this week's episode, I want to direct you to some of the non podcasty things we have to offer. First, if you're a fan of what we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon. For $5 a month, you get three things a shout out at the end of every episode, the opportunity to choose a movie we cover on the show, and our Patreon exclusive podcast, Film Theory and Chill in which we look at a piece of theory once a month, deconstruct it, and then just chill out, talking about whatever else we have going on. All Patreon support goes solely to paying our writers for their reviews that go up on our website every Monday. Also, at the bottom of Cinematary.com, you can sign up for our free newsletter. Every Sunday, we send out an email with the latest podcast episode, Patreon content, and written reviews. This is perfect for those who want to keep tabs on what's happening, but might be too busy to see the posts when they go up. Before I go, one more quick thing the easiest thing you can do to support us is to give cinematary a rating and review on itunes spotify or wherever you listen to the show this is quick free easy and we will read your review out on the show once we get it to recap consider donating to our patreon sign up for the free newsletter and please give us a rating and review thanks for listening let's get back to the show
And we are back with part two of episode 295 of Cinematary. In this part, we'll be concluding our Patreon picks series with the 2007 film No Country for Old Men, which was selected for us by Whitney Rio Ross. Uh, it was This movie was written and directed by Joel and Ethan Cohen, and it's based on the book of the same name by Cormac McCarthy, who, uh, shout out to uh, our Knoxville people. Uh, the film stars Javier mm. Bardem, uh, Tommy Lee Jones, Josh Brolin, Woody Harrelson, and Kelly McDonald. Uh, and, oh my gosh, I didn't even put the synopsis. Why did I not put the synopsis? I'm really struggling today, guys. It's, it's about um, it's some okay. fucking crime. <laughs> so while out hunting, well, Llewellyn Moss, played by murder. Josh Brolin, finds the grisly aftermath of a drug deal. Though he knows better, he cannot resist the cash left behind and takes it with him. The hunter becomes the hunted when a merciless killer named Chagrin. Chagrin? Chagrin? Sugar, whatever. Javier Bardem, who gives a shit, picks up his trail. Also looking for Moss, the Sheriff Bell, an aging lawman who reflects on a changing world and a dark secret of his own as he tries to find and protect Moss. Um, so the role of Llewellyn Moss was originally offered to Heath Ledger, but he turned it down to spend time with his newborn daughter, Matilda, so the role... Uh, Garrett Dillahunt was also in the running for the role, auditioning five times, but instead was offered the part of Wendell, Ed Tom, ba- uh, Ed Tom Bell's deputy. Uh, Josh Brolin was not the Cohen's first choice and enlisted the help of Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez to make an audition reel. His agent eventually secured a meeting with the Cohen's and he was given the part. Uh, Javier Bardem nearly withdrew from the role of Anton Chigurh, or whatever the hell his name is, due to issues with scheduling. And I like this. English actor Mark Strong was put on standby to take over, but the scheduling issues were resolved and Bardem took on the role because that's, you know, it's like the same thing. Uh, producer Scott Rudin bought the film rights to McCarthy's novel and suggested an adaptation to the Coen brothers, who at the time were attempting to adapt the novel To the White Sea by James Dickey. By August 2005, the Coens agreed to write and direct the film, having identified with how it, uh, it provided a sense of place and also how it played with genre conventions. Joel Cohen said that the book's unconventional approach, quote, was familiar, uh, congenial to us, were naturally attracted to subverting genre. We like the fact that the bad guys never really meet the good guys, that McCarthy did not follow through on formula expectations ethan cohen explained that the quote pitless quality was a quote hallmark of the book which has an unforgiving landscape and characters but is also about finding some kind of beauty without being sentimental the cohen script was more mostly faithful to the source material on their writing process ethan said quote one of us types into the computer while the other holds the spine of the book open flat which you know Glad you guys are getting paid a bunch to do that. Still, they pruned when necessary. A, t- uh, a teenage runaway who appeared late in the book and some backstory related to Belle were both removed in the movie. Also changed from the original was Carla Jean, Carla Jean uh, Moss's reaction when finally faced with the imposing figure of Chigurh. As explained by Kelly McDonald, quote, the ending of the book is different. She reacts more in the way I react. She kind of falls apart. In the film, she's been through so much and she can't lose anymore. It's just she's got this quiet acceptance of it. In the book, there is also some attention some attention paid to the daughter, Deborah, whom the Bells lost and who haunts the protagonist, protagonist in his thoughts. Uh, Joel Cohen ju- justified his interest in the McCarthy novel saying there's something about it there were echoes of it in No Country for Old Men that were quite interesting for us he said uh, going on because it was the I- the idea of the physical work that somebody does that helps reveal who they are and is part of the fiber of the story because you only saw the person in this movie making things and doing things in order to survive and to make this journey and the fact that you were thrown back on that as opposed to any dialogue was interesting to us uh, the C- Cohen also stated that this is the brother's first adaptation. He further explained why they chose the novel, saying, why not start with Cormac? Why not start with the best? He further described this McCarthy book in particular as unlike his other novels, it is pulpier. Uh, he stated that they have not changed much in the adaptation, saying it really is just compression. We didn't create new situations. Uh, in 2007, Time Magazine said the Coens are wintry and dead calm ironist, and their movie is finally less an assault on our sensibilities than a a subtle and possibly permanent insinuation into our consciousnesses. 
Uh, the New York Times said, for formalists, these, uh, those moviegoers sent into raptures by tight editing, nimble camber, cam- camera work, and faultless sound design. No Country for Old Men is pure heaven. In 2007, Roger Ebert said, No Country for Old Men is, is as good a film as the Coen brothers, Joel and Ethan, have ever made, and they made Fargo. On that note, let's dig a little bit into No Country for Old Men. Um, Dylan, I'm going to start with you because as let me see if I can find the text really quickly. Uh, Andrew actually was the one who said that I should get you uh, on this episode because he said, uh, I know seeing this was a formative experience for him. So please elaborate uh, on that. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I can. I'm not sure in which context uh, Andrew and I had must have had right, a conversation cool. <laughs> about that. No, I mean I could try to, but I don't know. I mean, um, uh, I mean I remember the experience of seeing it in theater for sure and being surprised by it. And you know, it was like hitting some uh, whatever like edgy 15 year old shenanigans that was going on in there. That it's like, oh, I've never seen a movie like that before, and so it you know gets that kind of uh uh adolescent praise for sure um and i think that was like the same weekend that i started playing mass effect so i think i was just like yeah i don't so know much stuff there, something about that weekend uh, yeah it's a good weekend i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> I don't know, it was formative because I got into Mass Effect, saw No Country for Old Men, things were happening. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's a good weekend, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, no, I mean, I'll, I'll stick to the, I don't, I mean, at this point, formative in the way to where it's just like, oh, movies, that, that they can do, people can do things like that, that's neat. Um, Serious movies, adult yeah, movies. Well, I don't, yeah, I mean, kind of, in a way, I'd have to imagine that yeah, that was at least some of that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I think to, uh, part of the quote unquote formativeness of it may have been to when I saw Burn After Reading, the Coen Brothers next movie, I was like, what the fuck is this? What happened to No Country for All Men? (laughs) And so I think there was like a, I was, I was like, I was seated in expectation and then the Coen Brothers, uh, slapped me in the face with, uh, Burn After Reading, which I now like at first I did not like because that's not what I wanted, but, uh go go figure so we're stuck with the weird silent violence of no country Great. okay um <laughs> ash what about you yeah there you go um well i hadn't seen this movie i guess since it came out so it had been forever for me i didn't realize until i watched it again how much i did not remember um but first impression um Josh Brolin's ass looks great in this movie. <laughs> um, just very good fit hard, of the jeans um, all the way through <laughs> um, when he's wearing jeans. Sometimes he's not. Um, um, that That's my first impression. I think that the after having seen, I think when I first saw this movie, I probably hadn't seen many uh, Coen Brothers movies except for probably like Fargo or something. Um, and I think that like their movies have this sort of like, I don't, I don't know how to explain it exactly, but it's very like glossy and like we're gonna we we pan the camera a lot we move the camera a lot when we when we make movies and i think that it lends itself well to like when they're doing like their funny shtick it's like when they're doing the like ironic thing in in like you know movies like a serious man or whatever where it's like haha awkward family drama but um it was a little, it was like, <laughs> I guess watching this, it was a little uh, sort of weird at first to see that um, sort of style in in this very serious movie. Um, uh, but, you know, I, you get into it eventually just because, like, the, um, the narrative is so terrifying and the characters are very you know Cormac's characters they're they're Cormac McCarthy characters and so um they're 
sort of compelling in that way. Um, I think the thing that I love most about this movie is the performances, though. Um, I think James Earl, not James Earl Jones. Oh my god! (laughs) (laughs) What's his name? The guy who plays Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones. (laughs) <laughs> um, uh, so James Earl Jones is awesome uh, in general, but he's not—he's he's not in this movie. Um, Tommy Lee Jones yeah. is in this movie. What if? Um, uh, and Tommy Lee Jones, I think, is just really good. And watching this movie made me just like hope that he's a really nice man in person because he he seems he seems like such a nice man uh in this movie he has a reputation for sometimes yelling at people on set unfortunately oh no well if he yelled at me i would yell right back i would be like where you should be a nice man (laughs) be like shut up james earl jones <laughs> That's exactly what I would oh say. Oh my god. I would I would Because I always that. forget his name. Ah. But no, I think the performances are good. Five stars to Josh mm-hmm. Brolin's ass. Um Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm I think I'm with you. Uh it's thinking going into this movie that you know, oh serious. Uh because I think for me the other Coens that I saw before that were like you know, raising Arizona and uh, and uh, uh, Big Lebowski. So it's was, it was like a tone I had in my head too. That was like, oh, this is a serious movie. Yeah. Oh right, Big Lebowski. Yeah. What about you, Zach? What's your relationship to this movie, if you have one? Um, the first time I ever watched it was on. Do you remember the iPods that had like the that were like super? It was kind of like the iPod Classic, but shrunk the nano um yeah wow. i watched this for the first that, time on an ipad, an iPod nano on a bus ride wait so it couldn't so, have been an original okay uh, so it was like the ipod nano with the screen on it, it? yeah yeah, so yeah. it was like the, it was like, like it was kind of the shape of the classic but smaller oh so it's basically goodness. the equivalent okay. just as of... the cohen's intended oh yeah wow. absolutely so I mean, basically I, the equivalent yeah. of watching this on an apple watch <laughs> pretty much yeah so i watched yeah. this that's the how i watched this the first oh time God. so a little, little trivia this, about zach i have to assume that you listen to it with earbuds in right like the uh, apple yeah earbuds. yeah oh, okay i mean i just yeah. needed to make sure yeah for the sound design of this movie it's just like you know there's apple. a lot going on it was a bus ride i was in high school hormones you know there was you know no country for old men was on you know there was stuff happening yeah um as you do no i i i caught it again around the same time when it came out uh you know, after the, the iPod nano thing, um, it was interesting rewatching it now because, and I think we'll get into this talking a little bit with Nathan, but, uh, it, it, I didn't realize how formative it is on a lot of different pieces of culture that we're, we're, we're dealing with today. Um, I don't know. I say that kind of, kind of negative. I don't dislike all of the, all the different things, but I think I think it does have a, a lot of impact on what we could describe as some prestige TV. Um, I mean, you know, it, I think definitely in that realm. Uh, you know, we'll we'll talk a little bit about it, but it definitely influenced a number of very popular video games that have come out in the in the you know following years. And I think it has had an, a an impact on movies, but I think. I think that the the more interesting impact watching the performance now is is Javier Bardem's performance because it's 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 a character that he similarly has played in various other movies, including Skyfall, the James Bond movie, which is pretty much him just doing this character, but you know, in a James Bond movie. Um, but I'm I'm curious, Nathan. I I do want to kind of jump over to you because I think. Um, you being kind of an agnostic to the Coen brothers is interesting because I know that you don't come at it as like a contrarian thing just to shit on them just to be different and so I'm curious what what about their movies kind of leaves you uh, leaves you cold yeah uh, I'm a little bit of a Coen skeptic as you said you know I mean it's kind of I feel like it's I don't hate them but their movies are just very hit or miss for me I mean I really like 
the Big Lebowski, part of that is just because, you know, I'm a stoner, big time stoner. You know, I'm I'm the dude myself a little bit. Um, but I really I like, you know, A Serious Man and Burn After Reading and Raising Arizona. I didn't like Hail Caesar at all. I didn't I've never really gotten Barton Fink. Um, I liked Hudsucker Proxy at the time. But I don't know. I just generally I'm just like not very excited for their movies because sometimes the kind of like cynical irony of their movies and the sort of human cartoonishness can be a little bit much for me in how they do it. Um, so this movie is interesting because it has a sense of humor and that dark comic edge, but it's more in this kind of violently realist package. Um, and this is a movie, so, you know, I hadn't seen this and I, I am a Coen's agnostic, as you said, but I like Cormac McCarthy. So I had always kind of meant to get around to this, but when it came out, I was like 13 years old. And I grew up pretty religious, and so I could still couldn't really see rated R movies. But I was starting to pay attention to movies overall, even though I couldn't see stuff like this still. And I remember this was one of the first years I started paying attention to the Oscars, and, you know, the best picture race that year was like this. There Will Be Blood. Oh, my God, that's right. Michael Clayton, <laughs> Juno, and I think, like, Atonement or something. Um, what in the world? Uh, that's right. And so it's very interesting being able to watch this movie for the first time now because I can have a little bit of a historical perspective on it. And the first thing I noticed is, like, it's produced by, distributed by Paramount Vantage, a company that doesn't exist anymore, and Miramax. And so on the one hand... It's very much kind of end of an era, you know, these 2000s, like, boutique studio-owned, like, indie air quotes distributors, like Fox Searchlight, and um, there's a Warner one, too, like, Warner Independent, and all these companies that don't exist anymore, and now, like, Prestige Cinema is more the product of, you know, your kind of A24s and Neons and your Netflixes and still kind of studios a little bit, but those sort of like little divisions of studios don't really exist anymore. Um, so on the one hand, it's like end of an era, but on the other hand, like Zach was saying, this is like, I was surprised to remember this movie came out in 2007 because it feels very like aesthetically kind of formative and, um, you know, I feel like it influenced like True Detective and Breaking Bad, but also it's a big credited influence on video games like The Last of Us. Um, I also feel like it's influenced Red Dead yeah, Redemption. Red Dead Redemption. Yeah, I also feel like absolutely. it's influenced yep. some superhero cinema, you know, like Logan. And I feel like Javier Bardem is even a little bit so, like proto Joker almost so in this movie. You can probably uh, point to Roger Deakins to why, but Zicario wouldn't look like and play like the way it does without this movie, right? Like, yeah, Villeneuve couldn't bite that style or whatever without Roger Deakins. I mean, there's that whole kind of cartel subgenre, you know, like mm -hmm. The Counselor, also pinned yeah. by Cormac McCarthy. Um, I mean, the Sicar both Sicario movies and then a couple other ones I can't really come to mind right now but it's a whole sort of 2010s kind of subgenre this like border cinema and it's I, I think to kind of jump off of those points because I, I think those are three interesting thing you know ways to kind of look at this movie the first i, I want to talk about is how it kind of was formative on at least tvs and movies because i i agree with you that re-watching this and kind of having the context of like a breaking bad in mind and i like breaking bad but this is definitely heavy influence on that not only just in terms of like the subject matter and it's kind of you know uh kind of dark irony type you know you, you kind of you bring that get comic sensibility that the coen brothers have into breaking bad but i think also just in the um the 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 prestigious loftiness of how you construct your you know not not just like uh the show in general but just like the the scenery you know you think of the the kind of um empty pastoral uh you know, shots in, in no country, you know, especially like in that, in that opening sequence where Josh Brolin is walking up on that, on that drug deal that went wrong. And I mean, it, it echoes a lot of scenes that are widely praised in, in Breaking Bad, where it's just kind of these, these quiet settling sequences. And, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm at a kind of a conflict with it because I, and what, 
in one sense, I don't find that to be a bad thing. You know, it's 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 natural yeah. for for things to kind of play off of each other. But part of me does kind of I don't know I don't love. Um, I guess it, I guess it's more of like the oversaturation. Like if everything is gonna look like this, you know, it kind of becomes tiring. And so it was that's why it was kind of interesting watching this now because it's it's a it's a kind of it's a kind of aesthetic. It's a kind of way about you know going about a narrative that we've seen so many times kind of emulated now and so it's it's weird going back and watching this what's interesting is so many 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 years ago very early cemetery episode when we still some of us went to the university of tennessee and we still used to record in that like journalism computer lab we did an episode about like the 21st century future classics like What movies were people going to look back on as the really influential movies of the 21st century? And, you know, we had some disagreement about movies. And I don't really remember, actually, what titles we put out there anymore. But I think now, 13 years later, we have the perspective to kind of look at this movie and be like, regardless of, like, your feelings about its quality or how it's held up or anything, I think you can pretty definitively say that this is, like, one of those movies that was sort of a watershed moment and and was like became a sort of popular touchstone where suddenly all of these other cinematographers or directors or game designers were like, hey, that's my kind of visual reference point of like make it look like No Country for Old Men or, you know, make the landscape look like it, make the violence, you know, that's sort of very brutal and and unsparing and visceral make it like that you know or make your performance like javier bardem in in that movie well it's so uh just uh, real quickly dylan sorry before Uh, i I do want to say just kind of adding on to that like thinking about the performances that you're you're in kind of the archetypes of of like storytelling that you kind of glean from this you so you take the javier bardem performance as like your villain because not only is he um you know, not, not not only is he like unequivocally evil, but he like ha- kind of has this evil that um, it's not like there's a, for, for lack of a better phrase, like a partisan line. Like everybody, like it, it's kind of this universal evil that everybody can kind of get behind. Um, that and so th- like that kind of archetype seems perfect to kind of just immediately carbon copy for stuff because he's sinister, he's terrifying. Um, I mean, the you, like the sequence where he's that whole sequence with Josh Brolin where he's at the hotel and he's like found him at the hotel and it leads to like the, the car chase and or not the car chase, but like the chase around the, the town and everything is, uh, is, is pretty like terrifying and thrilling. And, um, you know, just kind of that, that it, it, it offered a lot of very archetypal figures that you could kind of use. I mean, even from like the, the Tommy Lee Jones character who, uh, you know, is kind of, reflective it kind of has this very vocal reflection uh, you know it's, it's kind of an interesting yeah, performance absolutely. if you look at it you know in comparison to something like like john wayne and red river or john wayne and in the searchers which i think they're pretty comparable performances where it's kind of this reflecting back on how you got to this this point in the present and how uh a lot of the past has left you behind and in the present has become a whole different world for you and i i I think that wayne's performances in both of those movies are much more interesting because there's something much more internal and it's like you're having to kind of process you know through the acting kind of what he's um you know what he's going through and that's not and it's not a knock knock on what tommy lee jones is doing but i mean you think of like what people talk about with his performance and it's always that last you know monologue where he's talking about the dreams um it's all it's all much more um much more in the in in the uh in the verbiage rather than the kind of internalness which i think is more of a trademark of a lot of coen brothers movies but i think it's something that they're able to handle much more deftly than just any Joe Schmo who's directing an episode of like a Breaking Bad or something, you know. Um, but yeah. sorry, Dylan, uh, I interrupted you. No, that's okay. I mean, no, you ended up um, connecting some things that I was gonna uh, consider. Also, the um, uh, the part, at least about Javier Bardem, is really kind of like a strange, like composite or a mishmash because I think what I've heard is the actual reading of the character of Anton Chigurh in the book is rather sparse. And the only like actual description you get is 
he's he has no sense of humor and which is a line that we get from uh the the woody harrelson, I think the character. Woody harrelson character yeah yeah he says that to to llewellyn at the hospital and in, in um mexico or whatever and um but because that's literature or book you know in words and then you know uh harvey arbor Dim is actually gonna have to perform that character that it's um a bit different but uh part of the bag though is that um on one hand it you know coen brothers like to kind of play with this like ethnically ambiguous character they've yeah. even like set, set as much to like the character of jesus and uh and big lebowski oh, i mean yeah, and yeah. honestly john turturro in general right yeah like, john turturro is a fascinating yeah. actor in that regard right. even beyond the so, Collins. But it's but it's strange in particular in this case because Harvey Arbardim is definitely Spanish. He has a Spanish accent, and like, you know, I don't know too much specifics about his background, so I might be talking uh, too far here, might be overreaching. But like, to then you know like put him in this character, and then hearing all the Spanish that gets f- f- flung around in a kind of an ambient kind of way, um, it's just I don't know. I, it's weird that they decide to then. Other than the fact that he's a good actor and that they think he can pull it off and that he wanted to do it, that they would try to scrub his as his specific, you know, uh, nationality, specificity, the place where he grew up and just kind of try to make him ethnically ambiguous with a name like Anton Chigurh um, and have I'm him so like sorry they an fire assassin. alarm is going off in my house. <laughs> nice. It will it's hopefully a, be an, off it's very soon. I don't know if you can hear it do, in the background. Do you want me to keep yeah, going? Go, or is go it, ahead. No, it's, it's part it's of the okay. ambiance. Okay. Okay. Sorry. It's good. off now. Uh, that's good. Um, just and... thought I should clarify. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. That was definitely a fire alarm. Yeah, I can, <laughs> I can feel it. Um, and so, like, them, like, trying to pull this ambiguous ethnicity but then also kind of having like side characters of cartels and assassins and general quote-unquote mexicans because more or less the 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 purview of the movie is tommy lee jones which is another point i was getting to is is interesting on one hand but then it's just like they leave a lot of air open to the actual politics that are going on in this movie and because they can have this kind of ambiguously general evil of Anton Chigurh, it's it, it becomes a rather like uh, eyebrow raise. Like, you know, on one hand, I get it. You know, the global transnational corporations that are funding the drug cartels and these kinds of things and causing it to happen. But like, you know, to just say that Anton Chigurh is some kind of arbitrary evil is like kind of mistaking the fact that he still works for these corporations and that he took this job and sure that might be just who he is but why he's even allowed to be that way quote unquote in the first place i think erases the politics of the actual situation um or at least at least muddies it in a way that i don't think is necessary and other than to make it like generally um appetizing or able to consume to an american audience that doesn't want to think about the border wars and things like that uh down in texas and el paso um well uh, my last point was about tommy lee jones's performance and about prestige in general because i think this movie is given that error because of tommy lee jones and now zach you said that it's like not as well fleshed out or not as interior as a john wayne role and you know he was definitely left as like a patrician statesman actor whatever the fuck in the 70s 60s and 70s but tommy lee jones here is like bringing it again in a different way maybe without that same air but to, but the prestige of this movie or what eventually leads it to be quote unquote prestigious and accepted by hollywood is that it's about a tired old man who doesn't know what the what, what reality is anymore doesn't know what the future is and it is something about the fact that this is set in 1980 in general let alone in a contemporary time to where it's just like what's actually going on right now and i don't know like I don't blame it solely on Tommy Lee Jones or the Coens. I mean, the Coens have this character almost throughout their movies of the guy who's out of time and doesn't know what's going on. But to the point about its influence and prestige afterwards, I think, to your point, the Tommy Lee Jones intro over the landscape actually makes it cause the prestige to occur. You know, the I don't know what's going on anymore. This is actually way over my head. And, and he gives this folksy wisdom to where it's just like, Fuck yeah, I don't know either. That shit's wild. Why is this happening? Yeah. And the fact, also, my last point, is the fact that he gets out-folksied <clears throat> by 
the deputy friend who he meets right at the very end, right? Oh, he God, definitely yeah. gets out folks he's super They're talking about like hippies <laughs> oh, or whatever. <laughs> No, not even that guy. That guy was blaming, like, green hair and shit. No, the last guy, the guy who's just, like, like his uh, granddad's deputy, who didn't actually take the deputy role, but he, like, worked with his granddad and was, like, also kind of telling him a folksy story about change never is different. It's always the same, and you're always outpaced by the future and that kind of thing. And so I think all of those things happening concurrently, like, force it to be prestigious because it's just like old people watching this movie you're like yeah shit's fucked i don't know 2000s right this is i don't because can't see what's coming yeah there's no computers in this really either so it's just like you know it strips the confusion to even before that like unknowable violence even outside of the purview of someone who i guess doesn't have to deal with it on a daily basis i don't know sorry there's a lot in there um that's okay um, I just want to say, I think that, like, um, I mean, I don't know, people say that this is, like, a neo-Western, which, like, I totally see, you know, with, like, the hunting and stuff, but the Tommy Lee Jones character is, like, especially what connects it to, um, I think the Western genre, because it has that, like, mournful, like, you know, out-of-time thing, um, or whatever, but I also think that even more... Somewhat of a fairy tale ish Yeah, like, I think even more than with the Western, that what I was struck when I was watching this movie is, like, at least in regards to the kind of violence and the Javier Bardem character again, is that it's basically, like, a survival horror video game. Like, I can see why it's been so influential on games, because, you know, these kind of two guys are just, like, going over this landscape, hunting each other, tracking each other, collecting these items combining them together to figure out how to use them to kill each other like and part of it is just because i have recently been playing i mean i've been gaming a lot since quarantine started like everybody or a lot of people have been but i've been specifically playing resident evil 2 you know which is like an iconic oh <laughs> survival horror game where you're like your item hey. usage is very limited and, hey, and what's up is is anton Chigurh mr x uh, yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> okay. you know, but that game, you know, you're just like you've got like limited ammunition and you've got to use it strategically and sparingly and collect different items and stuff and kind of complete puzzles. And I've also been playing The Last of Us, which is like credited as an, you know, as being influenced by No Country for Old Men, in which also is a movie that or a video game, excuse me, that people say that Logan kind of ripped off. Um but that move, that game also feels very influenced by No Country for Old Men, and it's sort of like gritty, like southwestern apocalyptic realism. And like you know, this movie is honestly kind of apocalyptic in how like Javier Bardem is this sort of like Michael Myers of death. You know, like at a certain point, I don't even know what really the mechanism of the plot of this movie is. You know, it's just like a total like murder, just like hunting each other, following each other. Um, really, I don't know. It's it's kind of crazy. You just like I I for I, at a certain point sort of lose the plot a little bit. Yeah, I mean, if I if sorry, just just real quick, if uh oh, uh, if I give it some kind of like benefit of the doubt, Shigura seems to be if I'm trying to probably make him more of a character than he's actually written as that he tries to quote unquote control the fates by being the arbiter of death, and so you know as as eye as that character can be that that he's more or less pulling that off at least enough to carry the plot of the movie along but if i was trying to like peg what his deal is that like as much as he talks about chance and like you know tells people to call it from a flip of a coin and the assumption is that he's definitely gonna like murder them <laughs> after if they lose the the game of chance that it's just like he's trying to embody it even though he's also just a fucking human or whatever. But anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, Zach. I talked over. No, you're fine. Um, I do want to bring Ash back into the conversations because I feel like we've been dominating it. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on Javier Bardem's performance and kind of what that has left in terms of, uh, you know, similar performances? I mean, you mentioned the Joker, but I, I think that also just kind of bad guy performances in general like this is kind of a nice touchstone for for movies 
Yeah, I'm not so familiar with video games um, per se, but uh, I do like, I guess when you think of like classic movie villains, or maybe not classic, like as an old, but you know, just like, I, I feel like, you know, obviously this character is always on like the lists of like best movie villains. Um, but, and, and I feel like it's, uh, and you do get like Joker vibes or whatever. And I think that, uh, whenever, you know, it'd been years, like I said, since I watched this movie and I, th I remember Javier Bardem, um, his performance in this movie, probably most of all, um, is it, I rewatched it, um, just because like, I think he gives like this, you know, he's like this silent dude who doesn't talk and he just kills people or whatever. But then there's that like one early on scene um, when he's in the convenience store and the guy's just like trying to make some small talk. He's like, oh, you know, you coming from Dallas or whatever. And he's not, you don't even get the feeling that he's suspicious of anything. And, uh, Javier Rodin just, like, just, like, loses his shit at this guy. Like, this nice, this nice man. You know what I mean? And it's, like, and he's, like, asking him all these questions, and the guy's, like, sir. And he's, like, answer the damn question. And you're just, like, this guy's, this guy's a freak. Yeah. Well, this guy's yeah. a psychopath. <laughs> there you go. Like, okay. that's, that's the moment. <laughs> like, you've seen him yeah. kill a dozen people by now. And you're just like, okay, he's a soulless <laughs> entity who just exists to kill, and that is all. But then he has this moment in the convenience store, and you're like, no, no, he's not a soulless entity who exists to kill. Yeah. He's just a psycho. He's, right. He's making like some real hardcore judgments about this dude and his life. Because, I mean, to your point, like this dude was just kind of like trying to tell, ask him about the weather. But, you know, he find, he pokes at him and finds out that he was like... He asked him, was like, uh, have you ever left here? It was like, have you ever left from your home? Yeah, he's like, you married into your uh -huh. business. And, he's like trying to make uh, him feel bad God. about oh. himself. He's oh, yeah. like, he's like, uh, he's actually so detached from reality that it is so scary how detached from reality he is. And, and that I think is the most intriguing part of his character for me. I just kind of wanted him to talk more. <laughs> um, because I, I was just kind of, if, if he did talk more though, it would turn into one of those like, <laughs> like serial killer fascination, like true crime things where it's like, Ooh, let's get inside of the brain of, you know, and like fulfill our like sick fascination with death or whatever. But it, but he is just like, um, I mean, he, he is sort of better than, or, or like more interesting in a way than a lot of the uh, the other villains that we've gotten in in movies, and I think the you know if it weren't for this one, he certainly, or at least I wouldn't have been, um, I wouldn't have gone to watch whatever Bond movie was it was it Skyfall? Skyfall. Yeah, he was in Sky. Maybe I yeah, would Skyfall. have seen Skyfall because the the like home alone vibes but... it's 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 the same it's the same Fuck. character so you might as well yeah yeah but i same think same cinematographer i think i think people were you know. excited about that movie because because in part of his his role in this you know it's interesting like um the best supporting actor winner around this time the year before this it's heath ledger for the joker which of course then it's interesting he was considered for this movie then javier bardem and then it's Christoph Waltz in Inglorious Bastards, and they're all kind of similar characters a little bit. I feel like. Yeah, I mean, you. That's what I was gonna. I was gonna add to Ash's point is you have, you can see the appeal of, again, for lack of a better phrase, um, the Joker fandom. Like why people who kind of enjoy that character would enjoy this as well, because there's kind of that, as you were describing this this social detachment but also he, he's always um 
he's always you know propped up in ev- in every scene as the smarter person in the room like yes he's a psychopath but he also you know clearly is on top of whatever other person he's in the room with having a discussion with like there's something like, like it's, it's disturbing in the sequence that you were talking about ash because not only is he like outsmarting or is it, do you, is, is it like being presented that he's outsmarting this kind of um you know, country bumpkin who just works at a convenient at a gas station, but there's something kind of like, you know, sick at us. You know, try, if if you, if you're like relating to that character in that in that moment, like there, there's something wrong with you. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the gas station owner, and it's like this. It, it, it you know, it's it's kind of almost this like kind of incel culture of like uh, rejecting normalcy uh, that. It's it's a character that that seems to people have really latched on to in pop culture in general. So you're saying that Javier Bardem is an incel? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Check out that it haircut. Is. I mean, just, yeah, Probably just look at the so. haircut. Come on. Um, but so uh, Zach, damn, uh, I think you yeah you're definitely pulling that thread there because <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> like, no, I know it's just, it's just the the like the way this is like some strange like. Uh, like condensation of like a certain kind of character or like uh, sensibility that the Coen brothers have in their movie. Like uh, both you and Nathan have like particularly called them or like said the irony of this movie or them as ironist from that review that you referenced. But like that detached quality that Ash definitely could just underlined because of the scene is, is I, yeah, what, uh, is so disturbing i guess about it is that i i don't yeah the coins actually might <laughs> yeah might uh hold on mm-hmm. to this guy more than you would like them yeah. to be so them is like them as quote-unquote ironists yeah. you know of them basically like they, having that detached comic sensibility um to you, when well, you, you also yeah, like go going back to i think something that we mentioned a little bit earlier on you're not totally sure politically where they're sitting like they like they're kind of sitting in this agnostic point where it's like they're not engaging with anything you know it's kind of it kind of maybe i'm really leaping here but it kind of goes into like just the 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 just in I really what i find grossness of like people who just have really latched on to like something like South Park, which just is is rejecting everything every which way, and 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 feels like it's it's saying something through you know spraying at everybody, when at the end of the day it really doesn't say anything, and just like that hollowness of not really having any sort of moral core just leaves it kind of empty. So yeah, um, yeah. So I think I think here it takes it takes like shelter or it takes comfort, and it's period peaceness right where it's set in 1980 and it's supposed to be not during the war on drugs in the same way like if anything else there's still the you know uh money uh, money going south drugs going north that like kind of nicaragua exchange thing that's all like happening through south america and central america up to you know uh north america here that's caused the tension in the border war or whatever that the movie just kind of hints at and elides to because again the point of view more or less of the actual movie itself is this kind of aging sheriff who doesn't know how to deal with this change in reality and so they they actually construct the point of view in a way to where it can get away with that kind of edge of reality because or those edges of politics because they're saying the point of view character is this old sheriff tommy lee jones so it's like well, it makes sense that he wouldn't know about all these politics. It's all too much. Even though he is read as prestigious and competent, and in his way he is as a character, but because of that, it's just like given this leeway in that in, in that way for, for allowing the movie to not be as messy as reality actually is. So this movie might not just be messy enough for what actually is going on, even though it talks about the arbitrariness of violence and evil to where it's just like, it's actually messy, but the actual movie itself isn't that messy, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I I think that also, like, Tommy Lee Jones' character has a very, um, <laughs> I don't 
really know a descriptor to use. It's like a very quaint view of like good and evil in the world. It's like, you know, he's, he's, um, he goes to see, I love the scene where him and, um, his deputy, uh, I forget the name of the actor, go and, and like first see, yeah, they, they go and see the crime scene or whatever. I think just Tommy Lee Jones's like reactions to everything are really, uh, I, I think his performance is really great there. But then later, um, he has this like really interesting sort of take on everything. I can't remember if it's the scene, um, in the diner or, uh, or what, but he, he says like, well, I think, uh, or it's right after, oh yeah, it's the scene right after, um, spoiler, uh, Josh, Josh Brolin dies. Um, Bye ass. and ooh, do, do what? Bye, bye, bye to that beautiful jeans ass. Yeah. Yeah. Bye bye. Um, it was a sad moment. Um, but it's the scene right after that. And he's talking to this other guy and he's like, um, and the, the other guy's like, well, you know, you just can't believe all the evil in this world or something like that. And Tommy Lee Jones is like, well, I think when people stop saying, uh, sir and ma'am, then the rest is gonna be gone pretty soon after or something like that. And it's like, you know, such this like old time, like, reliance on politeness as, like, goodness, um, which is, you know, not the point. <laughs> Has never been the point, really. Um, and, and it's sad because, because, like, I like this character, but it's, like, he's so overwhelmed with just the state of the world and he's seeing all this evil and he's like, Oh, if people were just nice and said, yes, sir. No, sir. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if, uh, if I was to give him a benefit of the specific character he was saying that to, cause that motherfucker was already talking about like green hair, you know, kids walking in the street with green hair, acting like that's a fucking problem. <laughs> and like, because he was saying that to him, like I, I believe that Tommy Lee Jones or like his character, whatever, uh, the sheriff b believes that kind of sir and ma'am thing. But the, the way it specifically expressed itself in that scene makes sense because he was telling it to that guy who was already fucking on the lamentation train. And so, you know, uh, that just seems like the most because he was already like trying to get out of that conversation anyway. But yeah, it's it ultimately is kind of, a, as you say, Ash, like a quaint uh situation and that what we get left with is that dream that he was telling his wife uh loretta about that was you know trying to encapsulate his his future feelings as a retired sheriff yeah and i mean we get that line twice that's like um like you you can't see what's coming or whatever um you, you get it, like, twice in a row. Like, you know, it's... The woman says it to Josh Brolin um, just before he gets oxygen tanked. And then, um... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, he no, gets actually, shot, doesn't no, he? Like, he gets killed by... He gets killed by the quote-unquote Mexicans because they ultimately find him and why the whole thing is, like, trying to be unsatisfying or subversive or whatever is, like... The people that we like disengaged with earlier in the movie come back to actually kill him while the fucking whatever Javier Bardem Ultimate Evil or whatever is left hanging to just, you know, f be a dick to, uh, to, uh, uh, the wife character. I, I can I not, Claire Jean, that, that, you know, he goes and bothers her later for no fucking reason besides I made a promise to her. She's like, great, go. Go get your transcendent principles out of the way here, and just be mean to this woman. Um, Thanks. So well, we're, we're getting we're getting up there. Any any quick final thoughts on uh, on yeah. No Country for All Men before we leave? No, I'm no country for <laughs> thoughts in my brain anymore. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um. I think uh, just like the last last bit of business here for me is that they 
that they go on to make that Netflix original movie ballot for Buster Scruggs or whatever. That's, um, I don't think I really like it. I think I see why they made it and, you know, them liking this kind of Western motif thing and that some, some of the anthology shorts or whatever are better than others and that have more interesting things going on. But it like being a summation of what the Coen brothers thing is, uh, it's, I mean, it's kind of disappointing. I don't, I don't really know what they are doing at this point or where they would go after that, which is fine. They have like a whole filmography of solid movies for me, but like, you know, I don't know. Well, like Joel or Ethan on their own is doing a Macbeth movie. Uh, a what movie? A Macbeth movie? Macbeth. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I, the Scottish film. I believe it's probably Ethan if it was going to be the, between the two of them. He's like, a short story writer or whatever. So somehow I think it would be him, but Oh boy. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, uh, if, uh, we'll wrap it up, but I feel like there could be some more, I, some more interesting discussions related to, to no country for all men. Since we, you know, we were going in a lot of different places. It was, it was good. Um, you can find uh, Cinematary. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary. On Twitter and Instagram at uh, handle at cinematary. And on Letterbox at letterbox.com slash cinematary. We post all the movies that we talked about in this episode. Um, thank you so much to our patrons for uh, helping us through this series. We got some new patrons, so be sure to uh, send us your movie picks so we can you know start this back up again later. Thank you to Cam, Chad Newsom, Christina Daughtry, Cindy Roberts, uh, Gotham. Harry Eskin, Maggie, Maggie, Matthew Lingo, Pedro Seraphim, Ron Hayes, Three Eggs, Titus Arthur, Tyler Chandler, Whitney Rio Ross. Thank you so much for your patronage. Next week, we're going to be kicking off a shorty series, um, but one that uh, should be pretty interesting. Uh, for lack of a better phrase at the moment, it is called Filmmaking Elements. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a movie that is kind of um, seen specifically for being... Uh, you know, very proficient in editing, one on sound design, one on cinematography, and one on production design, visual effects. Uh, and we're still getting the order together on these. Uh, go to cinematary.com and, uh, later in the week, and we will have uh, a full lineup on it. But uh, that's what we're going to be doing for the next four weeks as we lead into episode 300 and Young Critics. So uh, be looking on the page. We'll have the, uh, the, ep- the episode the schedule for our filmmaking elements as well as the uh, young critics ballot and all of that good stuff in the next few weeks. Um, we also have, if you go over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash cinematary, we have a new film theory and chill, uh, on black spectatorship. And then we also have a chat I did with, uh, author J.R. Jordan on the director, Robert Wise. So two, uh, two Patreon extras to check out, you know, while you're in quarantine, But uh, yeah, thank you guys for listening, and we will see you next week.